So, uh, hello, we're speaking with Vladimir Gligorov, uh, well-known economist and also commentator on the Western Balkans. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit uh, about what has been the uh, fallout in terms of government responses in the region to the pandemic and also the economic consequences. So, Vladimir, how would you characterize um, the government responses um, in terms of trying to combat uh, the pandemic in the Western Balkans and how do you contrast it maybe to the rest of Europe or what is your impression? Well, I think uh, the, the government response, uh, I mean, most governments in the, in the Balkans has been more or less similar to what you see in other countries because uh, even in the United States, it took a while uh, for the government there to understand what is going on. And then, of course, there is an inertia because of uh, the expected costs that uh, the, whatever needs to be done should be done. Uh, it is probably true that in Serbia initially, uh, there was perhaps uh, even more of a misunderstanding or, or even a dismissal of this whole uh, virus uh, threat. Uh, that caused a delay uh, of a few weeks, uh, probably. Uh, and then uh, the response later uh, was uh, exaggerated in many ways, uh, in part to uh, compensate for the initial uh, lack of seriousness, uh, shall we say. Uh, so that would be, in a way, dissimilar to perhaps most of the governments in uh, the responses in uh, in Europe, uh, not necessarily in United States, and perhaps not necessarily uh, different than the initial reaction in Italy, for example. So. Yes, there was uh, there were delays in other countries in in the in the region. I don't think you see the same type of mistakes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is not altogether clear in in many of these other countries uh, what is going on because uh, it's not altogether clear that uh, whatever they are reporting. Uh, uh, is accurate uh, given their capacity to track and uh, and uh, even detect uh, or cover uh, the population with uh, with uh, not not even tests but but just pure detection of, of of what is going on. So this is really a bit of an issue of how weak governments are. Uh, in the region, not necessarily of how committed they are to going against the virus, but they have limited institutional uh, and generally uh, governmental uh, means to, to address these kinds of situations, uh, or as they have the limited abilities to address any kind of situation in their countries. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what is clear is, I mean, the, for the region, I mean, this is uh, another crisis after many crises. I mean, if you go back for the last 30 years across the Western Balkans from the dissolution, I mean, from the economic crisis of the 80s, the 90s, uh, then the 2008 crisis and the economic fallout. Um, so in a certain way, this is not just the first shock, but one in, many, in a row of many. Um, so what does this, you know, how is that different in terms of preparedness, but also what does it mean for that region, which is, you know, in a certain way has these very systemic, very large scale economic and social shocks and nearly, you know, once a decade for the last 30, 40 years? Well, uh, this is a region, uh, if we are talking about uh, uh, former Yugoslavia region, putting aside uh, uh, the, the Slovenia and, and, and heading Albania, 
but then also even the, the, the larger Balkan region. But, but certainly when it comes to uh, former Yugoslavia countries, these are uh, countries that uh, have been going backwards for 30, 40 years now, uh, assuming that they were going forwards in some way uh, previously under the, the, the socialist regime. I don't think you can say that about Albania, but certainly you could argue uh, that Yugoslavia was, until early 1980s, uh, uh, going forward the, in, in some sense, uh, certainly economically, if not necessarily uh, politically and, and institutionally. But thereof, I think there is a, a backwards movement, which is uh, not only related to, to the wars, wars were terrible, uh, but even putting aside uh, wars, uh, there were institutional uh, uh, and other basically uh, backward movements, not just stagnation or, or, or uh, lack of growth, but basically going backwards uh, in, in institutional, ideological, if you wish, cultural, and of course economic uh, sense. So, uh, and then of course, uh, some of these uh, countries uh, have had problems uh, which are connected with so-called failed states or, or weak states. And if you look at Bosnia and Herzegovina, you can debate how state-like that entity is in terms of what actually it can do. Macedonia has had a huge problems uh, constitutional, basically, uh, until uh, a few years ago, uh, and uh, Montenegro has uh, become an independent state only, uh, what is it, uh, 14, 15 years ago. So these are, and of course, uh, Kosovo is uh, in a, in a, in a state-like uh, position. So this is, uh, these are, and Serbia is uh, a, a country which is uh, uh, having more problems uh, uh, with its borders than uh, within its borders. So it's, a, it's that kind of a, a backward movement. Mm -hmm. So the countries haven't been prepared to deal with almost anything uh, that has been coming their way. They have not been necessarily helped uh, as much as, as needed, and certainly not in an appropriate way by the EU. Uh, so, and the other outside forces also, including uh, Russia, China, whatever, uh, and even closer neighbors. Uh, so you, you get uh, this kind of a situation in which then you have an epidemic which which is hard for people even to understand uh, let alone to to design a, a proper uh, action to to counter and then you have a relatively low uh, institutional capacity in addition to that you have to have in mind that uh, this backwardness uh, is a, a characteristic whereby uh, it, uh, the GDP, so to speak, uh, uh, goes down, but, it, but the, the qualification of the people, or, or shall we say, uh, human capital also goes, goes down. So it's the human capital that adjusts to the lower GDP rather than GDP adjusting to whatever human capital you have had before you, let's say, started a war. So a lot of people have left, a lot of people have changed their uh, professions or their activities from higher to lower productivity. Uh, you uh, become uh, 
a trader rather than a professional, you become a taxi driver rather than a, a professional and so on. But primarily there has been an exodus of uh, qualified people and also unqualified people. A lot of people have really left and are still leaving uh, the region uh, in the sense that once this is over, uh, they will all be going back to wherever they were informally mostly employed in. So this is the worst part of it, that then you get uh, less of a capacity, professional capacity, and also, and in this case, crucially, uh, medical capacity to deal with these kinds of uh, problems. Uh, many of these countries have essentially ruined their state-run health systems uh, and have uh, uh, gone uh, sometimes in an anarchic way, uh, private, so to speak, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, health care and in terms of hospitals and so on. It's not necessarily the consequence of, of austerity, as in some European countries, that, which we, the consequence of which we see now, let's say in UK, and I think even here in France, and certainly in Italy. But it's really, uh, that's not that, it's really a, a pressure to cater to people who have money rather than to people who don't have money in these kinds of backward situations. This is not unusual in an in a, in a underdeveloped or, or backward country. And uh, this is not conducive to fighting an epidemic. So you have uh, all these distributional consequences uh, whereby uh, poor uh, people uh, get uh, uh, the, the the most uh, exposure and get uh, the least uh, help uh, by the by the medical system. That's why I think we really don't know the the proper size of the epidemic in this region. So let's talk about what could be the consequences. I mean, of course, it's clear that the economic consequences will be dire for the region as they will be for the whole world. But what do you expect the fallout to be based on you know, earlier economic crisis? Do you think it's going, the region will be harder hit than the rest of Europe or will be able to recover? Or what, are the, what do you see in a certain way the dynamic um, following up economically from, from the crisis? Well, that partly depends on, uh, on the structure of the economy. Uh, again, in this region, uh, there are, uh, this is the Balkans, so this is a touristic place. So tourism uh, plays a role in, in uh, non-continental Balkans, which is Montenegro, Croatia, Tur uh, Greece, Bulgaria, even Turkey, if you, if you count Turkey as a Balkan country. Um, so th those sectors, and especially countries that rely heavily on those sectors, will have a uh, one, one, at least one season lost, uh, and that will be a huge hit. On the other hand, this is temporary, assuming that the season comes back. So this is like having a, a bad agricultural season, let's say. It's, it's devastating, but it's not necessarily something that you don't recover relatively quickly uh, come next season. You have to endure one, one year or so. So that's one issue. The other issue is uh, uh, some countries are net importers of food. Uh, outside of Serbia, everybody in, in the Balkans is net importer of, of food, which means that you will have a problem if there are difficulties in uh, interregional trade, which there are, because uh, obviously people will be looking after themselves rather than after others. Uh, in in a in a place where borders are just around the corner, uh, that will be a problem uh, in terms of supply, in terms of price, and so on. So that will uh, create issues, uh, not necessarily now, but uh, down down the road. That is 
in a way something that will help Serbia because it's a, it's still a, a highly agricultural and and has a surplus of a, of food uh, supply. So on the other hand, uh, there are problems with uh, uh, shall we say selling this supply. Uh, they have had to now open the, the open markets in Serbia, otherwise uh, what you produce you cannot sell. Uh, and that will then produce additional problems of um, how you uh, contain the, the epidemic and at the same time have people mingle in, in open markets. So these are like, a, so the, the agriculture may prove to be also a problem uh, and the cost, uh, though not necessarily uh, when you balance everything uh, out. So given that you could, exp you should expect, and given that in in industrial production doesn't play all that much of a role throughout the region and industry is mostly, apart from uh, services, is mostly affected uh, by the crisis, this should be, that should be a dampening uh, effect. On the other hand, services do play a huge role, and uh, there you will you will have a, a, a long, long, long enduring uh, effect. I think the key issue, apart from that, is uh, access to trade. If you think about uh, previous crises, especially the two thousand eight one, but also in the nineties. Uh, you will see that uh, lack of access to outside markets or rather increased uh, access to outside markets like after 2008 it was very helpful or lack of access uh, like in the 90s was terribly harmful. So it will be a problem, there will be an issue of uh, in this crisis how uh, much of a access to, in particular, European market will be there. And this is uh, something it, it, one has, still has to find out. Uh, because uh, again, though industrial production of one kind or another doesn't play all that much of a role, it does play a, a role in, in exports. And these are pretty much pretty open uh, economies. So there will be a problem of uh, going back to the markets in Europe. And if that happens, then there will be uh, rather bad consequences uh, for the region, especially for Serbia, Macedonia, and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. It is probably different from for uh, more touristic uh, oriented uh, countries, which may hope that uh, they will be exporting services next ne Come next season. So, to some degree, you're saying that um, it could be a it could be a, a temporary bump, but one which can be compensated depending on the policies and the access to markets, or one which might be more lasting if it were to be um, if the trade disruption becomes a more serious issue beyond a few months or beyond uh, this year, let's say. Well, yes, that is a distinction you could make. There are policy instruments that you can, you might have to address, shall we say, domestic markets, but there are not too many to address international markets, which for, for these countries are not irrelevant, uh, touristic ones and, and also industrial ones and agricultural ones, at least for the region itself. So these this is something that needs uh, international considerations and that will be a problem. Perhaps the policy issue there is that all these countries in one way or another have fixed exchange rates or use euro, which means you don't really have much of a uh, exchange rate policy to, to play with. And that may be a problem once you really want to uh, address the issue of uh, uh, additional access to, to outside markets. You could conceive uh, Serbia, which uh, has at least uh, uh, de jure, 
uh, a flex, uh, an, an inflation targeting regime or a flexible exchange rate regime, they could devalue. I don't think they will, but uh, but uh, that is an option they have. Other countries really do not have. Montenegro uses euro. Kosovo uses euro. Macedonia has been on the strict fixed exchange rate regime forever, and similarly. Bosnia and Herzegovina, which has a currency board. So there is no way in which they can actually use exchange rate policy to, to address that. And in terms of, uh, of uh, trade barriers, it's really on the other side. If, there, if those are lifted or, or, or not imposed or, or at least not adhered to. So these are uh, issues. Uh, Policy, internal policy-wise, uh, the real problem will be uh, fiscal capacity, and not in the sense in which you have it in within the euro area or in other countries, because in euro area you can at least print money. Uh, whether you choose to do that or not, that's another story. But you have that option in uh, this in the region where euro primarily is a reserve currency. You can't really print money. Uh, you can try to, to, to enlarge the, the, the banking uh, assistance, but again, these banks mostly rely on uh, euro as, as a reserve currency and a reserve uh, uh, deposit, so to speak. And, and again, they have a limited capacity to, uh, to do that. Other possible debt issuers, uh, corporations, and so on, have really very few uh, abilities to do that. And, and also, uh, perhaps putting aside Macedonia, more, all the other countries have very low uh, saving rates. So there isn't all that much savings that you can rely on domestic savings that you can rely on because these countries are uh, all relying on foreign uh, foreign investments and foreign transfers the transfers will probably also go down because a lot of people have come back uh, because they have been kicked uh, out uh, from countries they they mostly informally work at in so they, these are the the, the challenges uh, that you will have. Uh, you, you may want to do a lot, but fiscal constraints are significant because of the fact that uh, you don't really have uh, uh, your own uh, money, so to speak. You are Euro-based, but you don't have access to the uh, European Central Bank. There, I think, would be an interesting uh, discussion to have with the ECB whether they wanted to help uh, to find a way in which they could act as a, a backstop central bank for the region. It wouldn't really cost all that much. It wouldn't be a huge exposure. This is a backward, uh, relatively small in economic terms region, but it would be uh, very, very helpful. And it partly would be needed because most of the banking system in the region is EU owned anyway. This is, these are mainly Austrian, Italian, Dutch, uh, whatever that means, uh, banks. And uh, so it would make sense to find a way to uh, have uh, some access to, to ECB backup wouldn't necessarily make big problems for ECB. It would help these countries a lot, but that's down the road and, I, and it's an uncharted area and I don't know how that will work out. Uh, these, I think, are the main, uh, the main uh, constraints. So, as you can see, in most of the countries in the region, there is a rush to go back to, to, to work because it is not going to be possible to sustain this uh, virtual, so to speak, economic economics for, for much longer. It's easier in, in countries where they can uh, rely 
on the on the, on the ECB, uh, even though. You know, in EU, we, we, we have in your area, we have all these discussions about bonds and, and all that, and that is all fine. But the ECB is really buying uh, debt um, in an almost, an almost, at least by design, unlimited uh, quantities. This is a huge help that you cannot have if you don't uh, have your own uh, printing machine, so to speak because the your printing machine is constrained by uh, the reserves which are in foreign currency. Well, thank you. I think these are, offer some good insights also in terms of uh, what could be done or where, there, where, where or the limitations of what could be done. So I think we, we, we leave it at this uh, point, Vladimir. Thank you so much for talking you. to me. Uh, and we all hope that uh, the bump will be temporary and there will be ways to resolve it from being a too uh, long-term crisis. So, and all the best to you. And thank you so and much. Thank you too. Have, have a nice day. Bye.